Welcome to this service coming from the congregation of Mark the Evangelist, the Uniting Church in North Melbourne. A special welcome to those who are not normally part of this congregation but are joining us via the online streaming. The Lord be with you. The Lord draws near to those who seek him, to all who call in faith. Come, worship the Lord. All God's works are love. Let us pray. Great God, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. By your great mercy, we have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. You hold us safe with the gift of life that will not perish, but is kept for us in heaven. We gather this day as people worn and tired, hungry and thirsty, guilty and waning in hope. Be present to us in your Holy Spirit and relieve us of all that weighs us down. Feed us, abundant God, that the living hope of a gift of life might be renewed, that we may take up voice with all creation and sing to you with gladness. Amen. Our hymns for this service, if you are given to singing along with Peter, are all of the rather grand type, reflecting something of our principal text today from Ezekiel. Our first hymn, The God of Abraham Praise. Sacred name forever blessed. The God who reigns on high, the great archangels sing, and holy, holy, holy cry, Almighty King, who was and is the same. And evermore shall be the Lord our Father, great I am eternally. Before the 
the Savior's face, the ransomed nations bow, all praising his almighty grace forever new. He shows his wounds of love, they kindle to a flame, and sound through all the worlds above the slaughtered lamb. The whole triumphant host gives thanks to God on high. Hail, Father, Son, and Spirit, blessed they ever cry. Hail, Abram's God and ours, with heaven our songs we raise. O might and majesty are yours and endless praise. Our scripture readings this morning are just two. The first one, rather a long one, from the book of Ezekiel, the second in our series of readings from Ezekiel, recounts a splendid vision which Ezekiel has as part of his calling in exile in Babylon. Extraordinary, mind-boggling, difficult to penetrate, and our focus text for this morning. Complementing that, we hear from Matthew's Gospel, the set reading in the lectionary today from Matthew 14, miraculous feeding at the hands of Jesus. We listen for the word of God in the hearing of the scriptures. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel. In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Kibar, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Joachim, the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was on him there. As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the middle of the fire something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. Each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each of them moved straight ahead without turning as they moved. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Each moved straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. In the middle of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright and lightning issued from the fire. The living creatures darted to and fro like a flash of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same form, their construction being something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. Their rims were tall and awesome, for the rims of all four were full of eyes all round. When the living creatures moved, the wheels moved beside them, and when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. 
When they moved, the others moved. When they stopped, the others stopped. And when they rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures there was something like a dome, shining like crystal spread out above their heads. Under the dome their wings were stretched out straight, one towards another, and each of the creatures had two wings covering its body. When they moved I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of mighty waters, like the thunder of the Almighty, a sound of tumult like the sound of an army. When they stopped, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the dome over their heads. When they stopped, they let down their wings. And above the dome over their heads there was something like a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was something that seemed like a human form. Upwards from what appeared like the loins I saw something like gleaming amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all round. And downwards from what looked like the loins I saw something that looked like fire, and there was such splendour all round. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendour all round. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. For two and a half thousand years, Ezekiel's extraordinary vision on the river Chiba has captured the imagination of mystics and wackos alike. Winged creatures with strange faces, eyeballed wheels within wheels, a throned figure, fire, and all of this against a thunderous soundtrack. What is not marvellous in this striking account? Artists also have been caught up by the vision with all manner of attempts to, to capture Ezekiel's vivid description as an image. And yet for all the enthusiasm about what it was that Ezekiel saw, there is one word in his account which goes largely overlooked in those musings. The little word like. In fact, like or likeness appears 25 times in this account of Ezekiel's vision. And the words appeared or appearance, both in the sense of looking like, are found another eight times. The last three verses illustrate this most intensively. And from a dove and from above the dome over their heads, there was something like a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was something that seemed like a human form. Upwards from what appeared like the loins, I saw something like gleaming amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all around. And downwards from what looked like the loins, I saw something that looked like fire, and there was splendor all around. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor all around. 
This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The problem with any attempt to portray what Ezekiel sees is that while we can say, draw a picture of a person and say that our picture is like the person, how do we draw something which is itself like a human person? Because like a human being is not a human being. Like a throne is not a throne. Like amber is not amber. Like fire is not fire. This is to say that representations of Ezekiel's vision with human figures and shining jewels and fire and a throne are representations of what Ezekiel did not see. For what he saw was like these things. Now that might seem rather a subtle distinction, but consider the last line of what we've heard today, which really punches the point home. Ezekiel sees only the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This like language removes God, removes God as many as three times from what Ezekiel actually sees. He sees not the Lord, but the glory of the Lord. And not the glory itself, but the likeness of that glory. And not the likeness of the glory, but something which appeared like the likeness of the glory. Ezekiel's account is a kind of space holder for where God would be or what God would look like if God were anywhere or looked like anything. Or to put it differently, and I hope a little more simply, here we have an account of the transcendence of God, of God's being utterly beyond all in the world and yet still present to the world, pressing upon it. To capture this, God is indicated not by describing God, but by speaking about what God is like, which is kind of to say that not God, stands in God's place. God is thus always at least one step removed from anything we might say properly about God. God is always properly in the background to what we think we see and name as God. Now this is not about the poverty of language to express God, the fact that words fail, and it's not an evasion by God. In all of this, God is not being elusive, but is free. Throughout the book of Ezekiel, we're going to hear again and again the refrain, and you shall know that I am the Lord. It occurs over 50 times in the book. Here the name, and it is a name, Lord, is crucial, as is the fact that the refrain is never you shall know I am God. It is Lord and not God which matters here. This word Lord in English reflects that in the text we have in Hebrew the divine name that's given to Moses when he's addressed from the burning bush. We usually say that name in English as Yahweh or as Jehovah in the old money. The meaning of Yahweh is itself a little elusive, but we know that it implies something about being and self-determination. Who are you? Moses asked. I am who I will be, God answers, or I will be who I will be. This is a name which communicates the character of the one who bears it. I will be as I will be. So God here names God's self as the one free to be God's own. So God's transcendence is not about God's location, being over or above or beyond. It's about God's freedom. Ezekiel's encounter is with a God who relates to the world as creator, as lover, as judge, as redeemer and yet is not a part of the world, 
is at best only like this or that thing we already know. Now, a question which might tempt us here is, what use then is a God like this? It's a tempting question for us because useful things seem to us to be what we most need. We assess our situation and we determine what it demands. We are building things. We are protecting things. Our future seems to us to be in our own hands and what is useful aids us in our work towards that future. But what is free, what is radically free, is precisely what all of our projects seek to overcome because free things break with order and they challenge the status quo. Whether it be the wild child or a raging storm or an advanced tumour, free things disrupt our own stories about ourselves. A God we can't get a handle on, who is only like this or that familiar thing, and so is really unlike anything. Such a God is a threat to our stories about ourselves. And that's the case whether our stories are positive or negative ones. When our stories about ourselves are proud and arrogant, such a God would reveal to us death, would reveal that our kingdoms are not God's kingdom. And when our stories about ourselves are bleak and desperate, such a free God would reveal to us hope, for this God sees further than we do. What might we say such a free God is like today? There is among us at the moment something like God, in its freedom at least, a radical disruptor which is revealing to us that our best laid plans are susceptible to the threat of death. For what else is the virus but such an unfettered interruption? We will doubtless yet discover useful tools beyond what we already have and will bring this terrifyingly free agent of death under some likeness of control. And our prayers are with those who are charged to fashion those tools, be they regulations to keep us safe or the magic of advanced medicine. But to add to those tentative reflections of last week on the relationship between the virus and the judgment of God, perhaps we could see in the virus not quite God, but a likeness of God's own freedom to approach us in times and places least expected. To approach us whether we're on the banks of the river Chibar in 593 BC with condemnation and promise, or to approach us here and now with whatever will shake us into a richer humanity. For as then so also now, it's only such a free God who might be able to dislodge us from our arrogance and self-delusion, from our indifference or self-satisfaction, from our grief and our fears. And do we not need a jolt like that? All of this is to say with Ezekiel, that when the God who is like nothing we know comes to us, it is to reveal that tomorrow belongs not to us with all of our plans and our projects, but belongs alone to God. And unlike a virus which simply wipes tomorrow away, God comes to us calling us to meet him in that tomorrow where condemnation resolves into grace, where darkness yields to light, where weeping gives way to joy. What, in the end, 
is not to like about a God like this. Let us pray. We bless you, O God, for out of a desire to love and enjoy us, you have created and sustained us and all things. And yet we confess that in thought, word and deed, we have fallen short of the glory for which we were made. Forgive us when we imagine ourselves so familiar with you that we close ourselves to challenge and judgment and so also to your healing grace. Forgive us when we imagine that we know where you fit, that we know what use you are, and so keep you distant from ourselves. Forgive us then when we are not challenged in our indifference or arrogance, our self-satisfaction or greed, our fears and desperation. In all this, gracious God, have mercy on us. God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. All of this, that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey me. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. In this we hear Christ's word of forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Through Ezekiel, God promises, I will make a covenant of peace with you, and my dwelling place shall be with you, and I will be your God. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We join together to confess the faith of the church as we find it expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We move to the Lord's table. Christ our Lord invites to his table those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Jesus says to us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come into them and eat with them, and they with me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for you are creator, lover, and judge of all the earth. From the peoples of the earth, you took Israel as a beloved bride and pledged yourself to her in a covenant of love. When she turned away and became a house of rebels, you sent your messages to stand as sentinels, to watch and to warn, and to declare your judgment. When the people refused to listen, you sent your son Jesus and set him over them as a shepherd in the likeness of David to seek the lost, the strayed and the injured, that ancient bones might live again and know that you are Lord. Restored by your spirit, hearts of stone gave way to hearts of flesh that we might again be yours and walk in your ways. And so we praise you with the faithful of every time and place, joining with choirs of angels and the whole creation in the eternal hymn. Oh, 
We bless you, God of grace, that on the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and blessed you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given for you. When the supper was ended, he took a cup of wine and blessed you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, as we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we commemorate Jesus, your son. Death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as Lord of creation. Great is the mystery of faith. Gracious God, send to us your Holy Spirit, that bread broken and a cup blessed may be holy, and that through them your people may become one. Unite us in faith, inspire us to love, and encourage us with hope that we may receive Christ as he comes to us in these tokens. God of grace, your people praise you. Lord, you are the bread of heaven, giving life to the world. You fill out our emptiness with your goodness. You come to our weakness with your strength. Come, refresh, renew, and restore. We pray that your church may hunger and thirst after righteousness, that your church may seek to care for and feed the hungry in spirit. May we seek out the lost, and those in desert places, and offer them the sustenance of the gospel. We pray for study groups, for mission outreaches, for councils and vestries. Lord, you are the bread of life. Feed us now and evermore. We remember before you the starving peoples of our world, those who suffer from famine, poverty or war, those disrupted by the ravages of the virus. We pray for all whose lives are fragmented, for all who are broken. Lord, you open our hands and satisfy the needs of every creature. Lord, you are the bread of life. Feed us now and evermore. Bless our loved ones our homes and our communities. Fill up our deep longing for you with your presence and your peace. We pray for all who feel drained and empty, all who have no energy or strength. Lord, have compassion upon the weak, the weary, the harassed and the helpless. We come to you for renewal, refreshment and hope Lord, you are the bread of life. Feed us now and evermore. We give thanks for those who hunger no longer or thirst, for they've been refreshed in your kingdom. May we look forward to the day when we share with them in the glory which is everlasting. Lord, you are the bread of life. Feed us now and evermore. 
these prayers we gather together and join into the prayers of Jesus, praying as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break bread as the body of Christ was broken. And we bless the fruit of the vine as we bless the pouring out of Christ's life. The death and life of Christ, the gifts of God for the people of God. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Gracious God, we give you thanks that bread broken brings holiness, that wine poured out replenishes. And so we give thanks that you feed all who reach out hands to receive your son Jesus, and you feed to those hearts which reach out to receive what hands cannot. May we who have a share in the breaking of the bread and the cup express that gift in the sharing of our lives that others might also share in Jesus. Send us forth in the power of your Holy Spirit to give ourselves in love until your entire human family is gathered at your table, glorifying and praising you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn, Holy God, we praise your name. Save us, you have come. 
all our sin and sorrow bearing, you have brought us saving grace, freed from guilt our sinful race. Spare your people, Lord, we pray, by our thousand snares surrounded, free from sin today. Never let us be confounded. Grant us with your saints a place. All our trust is in your grace. The God who is unlike anything calls us to be like God. Go then to do and to be in the world as God's surprising likeness. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen.